Welcome to the One Away Show, presented by BW Missions. I am Brian Wish, and I am your host, and thanks so much for being here. On this show, I sit down with compelling entrepreneurs, authors, and rising leaders to talk through their most transformative relationships, experiences, and epiphanies. Curated with entrepreneurial leaders in mind, we'll dig into these finite moments in people's lives and understand how they helped set their path forward. Pat McGinnis is a venture capitalist, writer, and speaker who invests in leading companies in the United States, Latam, Europe, and Asia. He's the creator and host of the hit podcast FOMO Sapiens, which is distributed by Harvard Business Review and has achieved over 2 million downloads. Patrick coined the term FOMO, short for fear of missing out, which was added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2013. He has been featured as the creator of both terms in media outlets, including the New York Times, Financial Times, Boston Globe, Guardian, Inc., Magazine, Cosmo, and MSNBC. His TED Talk, How to Make Faster Decisions, was released in 2019. He's the author of international bestseller, The 10% Entrepreneur, Live Your Startup Dream Without Quitting Your Day Job, A Guide to Part-Time Entrepreneurship. It's been translated in over 10 foreign languages and been featured by BBC, MSNBC, CNN, Espanol, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Forbes, Fortune, and many other media outlets. As you can tell, Pat Patrick is one of a kind. He has a very charismatic personality. He's a sharp thinker and just somebody who I just admire deeply. So hope you enjoyed today's episode as much as I enjoyed recording with him. He is awesome and somebody to follow and get to know. Patrick, welcome to the One Away Show. Hey, good to be here. Absolutely. It's great to have you and uh, get to meet you through a mutual friend. I you know, uh, research your background a bit and gotten to know you a bit, but curious, you know, what is your one away moment that you want to share with us? Yeah, I would say, uh, well, there's, there's so many, there's not that many, there's like a couple, but I'm going to focus on one, obviously, which is, um, I woke up in September of 2008 and three in the morning in a hotel room in Charleston, West Virginia. And I was covered in a cold sweat. I got up from the bed. The bed was wet. My pillow was wet. I mean, it was crazy. I went to the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and I just felt really sick. And that became the beginning of a whole set of things that happened in my life. But it started in that hotel room. Okay. You're, you're leaving me on an edge. I bet I'm making you work today. <laughs> Great. That's why we're here. Uh, so I'm on an edge right now. I, it sounds like a very scary experience for you. Uh, what happened after? I mean, what, like you, you had the sweat and then it sounds like it was very transformative, but like what, what led you to the sweat? Well, what happened was, so I get up in the morning, you know, it's that, it's that moment of like, something's wrong with me. Right. I wake up in the morning and I hadn't felt that well. You know, this was right after the 2008 financial crisis. It was just a few weeks after my employer, AIG, I worked in their private equity division, had been basically nationalized by the US government. It blew up. My stock fell 97%. I felt deep stress. And I, you know, that's kind of what brought me to that place. Uh, and then the next morning I wake up, you know, and I'm like taking a shower and I recognize that I have a swollen gland which is not a good sign, like lymph nodes. And so I Google that and I realized, you know, I've never had this before, but like something is seriously wrong with me. So I call my doctor, I set up an appointment. I fly back to New York that day. You know, I feel very sick, really unwell, very off. I go to the doctor and basically he puts me through a battery of tests and everything is wrong. Everything is off. And it turns out actually that they could never really figure out what was wrong. It was like stress and you know maybe some sort of viral thing. But all, all I knew is that I wasn't really feeling very good. I actually didn't really get out of bed for five days. And then when I was able to move again, you know, I had blurry vision. Um, I couldn't really do all that much. Um, I, I just felt bad and tired and sick. And that went on for like six months. Mm -hmm. And so it just was this period where it, I, because of that experience, number one, I really withdrew from society. Like I didn't see people, I didn't leave my apartment. Um, 
And number two, I, I just was like, I need to figure out what the heck is going on and also figure out how to get better. And, and so that began a process of re-examining my health and my career, my priorities, everything um, that, that, that I ended up changing to get to the place where I am today. Okay. Thank you for the context. Super helpful. Uh, before we move on, I want to go back, but before I go back in time, how old were you when this happened? Uh, 30, 32 ish in the 32 range. Great. Well, you look like you're like 32, 34 anyway. So clearly, it, you know, <laughs> just clearly it helps. Just um, clean living, clean living. There you go. So, okay, let's, let's go back before you woke up this crazy cold sweat, maybe share with us your lifestyle, maybe your work, your health, your maybe food consumption, your, your parting, uh, you know, whatever, what was your life like for the listener that maybe led up to this health freak where you really had to get your life in order? Yeah. So listen, I've always been somebody as a kid, I was very overweight. And then when I hit the age of, um, about 16 or so, I lost like 50 pounds and got in shape and was quite thin, um, and maintain that do a do not particularly a overly healthy diet, just like by eating, you know, not that much food and being careful kind of calories and stuff like that. And I wasn't much into, I wasn't much of a, I like like tennis, but I wasn't very into sports um, and exercise until college and business school when I started running more. Um, and then I got really into running and, you know, go to the gym like anybody does and do the weights and all that sort of stuff. So I, you know, I did all that kind of stuff at the time, but my work at the time working in private equity in emerging markets, I was on the road, I mean, all the time. I was, I went to Istanbul 30 times in five years. Um, I went to Pakistan once a year. I went to China twice a year. I, oh my goodness, where else I go? Colombia three, four times a year for work. Um, and so definitely a lot of business dinners, socializing. So I put on like 30 of the pounds that I, of the 50 I had lost over the progression of a number of time. Wow. Um, and then when the AIG blew up, I just basically emotionally freaked out. Watching my stock fall 97%, watching our firm blow up, like it felt very personal to me. So like all of that stuff together was like a perfect storm for me to like, you know, I think kind of get sick. Mm. Wow. And okay. Uh, the AIG where you were working, uh, your financial crisis sounds like you had a really hard work ethic and you were maybe the type to just say yes and really make it happen, go abroad. Uh, to do that though, you know, you, you kind of are built with the hard wiring, whether through life experiences or how you were born or just all the things. So if we're digging a little deeper here, was it maybe just the obesity that you mentioned that made you so motivated? If not, you know, what were other factors that led to this hyper ambitious path that you pursued? Yeah. So I think that's, you're, you're, you're right. So I grew up in a small town in Maine, um, very middle-class kind of town, a, a mill town. Um, you know, my grandparents worked in factories, um, my, my, my dad worked for the government. My mom worked at a local business. You know, they, we had a, you know, a very good solid upbringing. Um, but it was a place where I didn't see a future for myself necessarily. I love it there and I love visiting, but I didn't see like a, a, a professional career that I wanted. And I was always very good in school. And so I was a grinder. Like I would, I mean, in high school, <laughs> in high school, I just really wanted to go, go to college. And if you ever seen the movie Election, I want to go to a good college. If you ever saw the movie Election where the girl, Tracy Flick, wants to go to Georgetown, like I wanted to go to Georgetown. I basically was like Tracy Flick. Like I used to wear a blazer to high school where like people were wearing like sweatshirts. I dressed like I was, I don't know what I was saying. It was really something. You see my, year, you see my yearbook. It is a lot. Um, I was president of the National Art Society. I studied like... I studied so hard. I would like study things that weren't even assigned. Like I was just so hardcore. Um, mm. 
really hardcore, but I did well. Um, like I was pretty much, I was a bit of an aggressive grade grubber. So anyway, I was taught my mindset, and this is also a mindset that was imparted onto me by the culture of where I grew up, where people just worked in factories and they worked really, really hard. And work was seen as this like fundamental thing in life. Like the, the most important like the most important thing that you can do is work really hard. That's the value that is uplifted. It's not like he worked smarter. He only worked four hours and got it done. No, no. Hard work is like, it's like a Catholic value. Ergo, um, I adopted that into my own way of living my life for a long time. Hmm. And I still work hard, but like, I definitely at that, you know, I, I think I, I, you know, just, I do a lot of things. Right. And I mean, I think to your point, though, you might have scratched that to an extreme, but it asks you, you're rewarded by the, you know, nature of what hard work brought and sounds like in it, you know, the way it fulfilled you by working at things and learning things that weren't in the scope of what you were supposed to do. So, you know, I can see how it led to the negative a moment, but, you know, it probably came with so many, so much more positives as, as you've been able to adjust. So thanks for sharing. It, that. it totally did. I think where I overdid it was like, you can be a super hard worker, but if I, I was the guy who like would never leave the office before my boss left because I also like was doing like FaceTime. And so there was a lot of like performative hard work, you know, in the, in the 2020 parlance or whatever, that is so ridiculous. Um, so I think I could have found more balance, but I just, I didn't have experience in, in doing that at the time. Yeah, you didn't know what working smarter was. Uh, got it. I think we all, we, we think we've all been there, us who are ambitious and uh, sometimes understanding our self-care lines is, is a hard blend until life slaps us hard. Um, so Patrick, I, I really resonate with this for a lot of personal reasons, but uh, this, this is your show. You hit the moment of you know truth when you woke up, and you, know, you gave us backstory into your hyper ambition and the world travel and growing up what that was like. Um, you know, once you figure it out, you needed to get your self care in order. Uh, what did you do? How did you maybe break down your life? What like you know for the person who doesn't really think about their health as their number one priority. Where do you start? What do you, what decisions did you make? And then what did you see as a result? Yeah. And I don't, we didn't have the word self-care back then. It's so funny. So like, I like, I, I, I say that word now sometimes I always, it's such a funny term. I don't even know like what I think about it, but, um, but it, it is what you're, that's what that is. And so you, it is the appropriate term. So, okay. So here's what I did. Oof. Digging back into the, into the vault here. So basically one thing I'm really good at is losing weight and getting in shape because I did it in high school. And like, I'm very disciplined. I'm an incredibly disciplined person when I know what I'm trying to achieve. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to like get in shape. I'm going to take care of myself physically. And so that began like, for example, like, you know, just eating very healthy, staying in, not going out. Um, once I felt better, I started running a lot. Like maybe I, the most I'd ever really run was like three miles in my life. I ended up starting to run 30 to 40 miles a week. Wow. Um, I ended up running the marathon. Wow. And so, yeah, I got, I got really focused on running because my, my view was like, if I run, like running is what will get me out of this problem. It'll get me back into health and into shape. And of course I overdid it because I'm totally hardcore. And um, I ended up then getting into yoga as well, which really worked well with the running. So I think it's like my, my big challenge in life is like not being extreme. I'm like that Billy Joel song. I go to extremes. Like, like when I decided to lose weight, I just like was super hardcore about it. And like, just like, yep. um, like not unhealthy. I mean, I, I didn't, wasn't like, you know, starving myself, but just like, you know, every, every meal was like just super healthy and, you know, perfect. And, you know, running. So that was, and then, you know, I, I also like, one thing that I think I did, it was really good. Well, sleep was really important for me. And so I took a lot of naps and stuff. And um, I kind of just like checked out at work. So I would go to work, but like, I'd get there really late and leave early and like in the middle of the day work out because everybody was checked out at that point. Cause our company was kind of in, in, impaired. 
Um, and then on the other side, I felt, this is like the part that I think is really hard too, is I felt like ashamed of my situation. Like I had done something wrong mm. because, you know, it's like, well, I clearly didn't take care of myself. So, mm. you know. Totally. Can I, can I probe a bit? Probe. Go there. I, if I, if I hit hot buttons that you don't want to touch, let me know. Uh, only, no, you go ahead. Only because I think I've been on parts of this journey in my life with you, just not with you. Um, you know, we, when you do things at an extreme, uh, your hard work was one, your health was another, uh, where everything becomes rigid and very regimented as well. Right. That can, affect you mentally i think uh, mental health uh do you have you found any you know what was your experience with your mental health along this health journey that you're trying to revamp and maybe back to the journey at aig when you kind of hit this meant you know this scare it's interesting so on a mental health perspective like i find it hard in life not to be like i i mean i'm sure it'll happen god forbid but uh, I find it hard to be upset about anything for more than a few days at a time. Like I'm such a natural optimist that I always sort of, even if something bad happens, I'm able to sort of find the bright side or focus on the good things that are happening in life and be grateful for the good things and the little pleasures and stuff like that. So like actually mentally, I think what helped me a lot was like, I had a goal. I was like, I'm gonna get back in shape. I'm gonna be healthy. And, and I'm going to just like do everything I need to. It's in my power to get there. And that really focused me. So I, I have to say from a mental health perspective, actually, you know, I felt pretty strong. I did feel like I had to hide this from people though. Hmm. And so, which is why I'm talking about it now, because I think that that's ridiculous. And so like, I try to be more open about these things, even though I, like, I don't like talking about, it's not like fun to talk about this, right? It's very personal, right. but I, I've made it like a decision to be more more forthright about these challenges because like there was nothing I had nothing to be ashamed of right. you know we all make we listen not everybody's healthy all the time not everybody makes smart decisions not everybody takes care of themselves but like you know th that's not a shameful thing you just need to sort of like get help from people or from yourself got it and and can you maybe and I appreciate you sharing this kind of personal moment of your life on our first video live conversation right but it's, it's great I what maybe can I ask why like why did you really feel the need to hide it and and now that you're open about it or more open about it what effects are are you seeing about being you know very transparent about your journey yeah I think it's because I, especially as men showing weakness is really hard so that's weakness right it's total weakness it, it, the way I, that I, I viewed it at the time um I'm you know and I think that's why I had problems I think you know, when you're a very ambitious person who's very, who's had a lot of success, you want control um, as much as possible. And so like the idea of giving up control or confessing or admitting that I didn't have control to me seemed like a really scary thing to do. Mm, got it. Yeah, got it. And I think that, I think you hit on something so important is control uh, is something that I, like, I think hyperachievers or entrepreneurial types have because they want to be so in charge of their dreams. And, and it, I think it can be unhealthy at times, right? And when you try and over control things and, uh, you know, we, we all have our own personal and professional bouts of where that's backfired. So yeah, think um, about like Elon Musk tomorrow. If he came out, and was like, oh, you know, I'm, I've got all these issues going on. Like people are so used to just thinking he's like a Superman. Right. And of course we all know that it, it, it's total, you know, I, I'm not saying he wouldn't do that. I don't know him, but I'm just saying like, we want people are either like heroes or losers in our in our culture. So and you always want to be on the hero side. I, well, I mean, that's the, the bias. Well, to, to build on this, Patrick, what's so I think poignant to what you're saying is I, I just finished watching the Tiger Woods document then on HBO Max. Have you seen it? No, I have not seen it, but I, I have HBO Max, so I could watch it. I I mean, whether you like sports or not, I think it's a very it's so many parallels to Michael Jordan, but of like being greatness, but this hyper alpha masculine, whether male or female, but hyper masculine male who was expected to keep it all together mm -hmm. uh, and control everything around him as it really alludes to in the second part of the series. And, and I think you can see, you know, 
that is to your point what society wants from us to be vulnerable to uh open up and share is, is a weakness and hard um for you though patrick i mean we're emotionally is it a skill that maybe growing up you never really developed or worked on where it wasn't okay to talk about at home or you know what's allowed you to really kind of break that wall down so you you can do it and you know be more comfortable with it i don't think it was like a thing in our house um i think my we were very supported and my parents were like very in tune with me and my brother but I'm reading this book right now that is like kind of blowing my mind a little bit. It's like, which is a book called Milltown by a woman called Carrie Arsenault. That's doing, it's been quite um, well received this year. It's getting a lot of press. And um, I actually reached out to the author because I thought it was such a, it's, it's basically about her growing up in a small Franco Canadian town in Maine. That's a mill town, which is exactly what I grew up in. And there's so many parallels between her um, it's it's a really it's it's kind of a mix of like Aaron Brockovich and um, Hillbilly Elegy. It's about her realizing that the the town factory poisoned all the people who work there who are French Canadian. Mm -hmm. And there's something about the French Canadian French Canadian people were like super marginalized because they were immigrants who spoke a different language, and they were very religious. So they were like hard. They were like very good rule followers, and they were taken advantage of to work in these factories, even though they were getting poisoned. So it's like a crazy, crazy story. And as I read that story, I'm like, oh my god, that's totally the culture I grew up in. Like you sort of like, you sort of don't raise your hand to complain. You sort of don't talk about that. You just kind of like go forward, push forward, get things done, work hard, do it. And I think that that is, there's a lot of value to that mindset. So I don't dismiss that at all. I think they gave me a lot, but I would say like, as a result, like people up there don't talk about that kind of stuff. You know, like it's not, you're, it's not, it's not something that's culturally, you know, like in, in, in other cultures or other traditions, like I think there's a lot more openness around certain things that we just didn't have. Got it. Makes total sense. And, and, you know, I look at someone like my own father, who grew up probably in a very similar environment, right? He was kind of get things done, don't talk about it, just because that was the way of the culture. So I think growing up, if you, that's, that was kind of hardwired into you, that's not going to be natural to you later in life. Yeah. When, um, yeah, I think this is so interesting, right? Because there's this, there's this positive, or there's multiple positives, like you had this tipping of kind of the spectrum experience where you had to make some hard changes but those hard changes also led to not being super comfortable to like share and be vulnerable about those ex that experience in itself which then now has led you to become more vulnerable so it's like a two for one in a way i don't know if you ever thought of it like that um that's a good way of putting it i like that yeah i i just it's very interesting what so just for the men out there those are the ambitious people out there who want to act like everything is okay all the time what would be your advice to them uh, and how to maybe make themselves a little more naked and show up in, in a meaningful way and say, hey, everything's not okay? Yeah. Well, you see all these mental health problems, especially in like the tech and entrepreneurship community right now, that conversation is happening. And also like with work from home, mental health issues have become an epidemic in America. Like it's a mess. Like there is a reason why people are like on extremist websites, like plotting to overthrow our government. It's because like they're unable to I don't know they're just like people are very isolated and not connected and all this sort of stuff so like this is a this is a problem and like and if if you are feeling this way like you you shouldn't you need to fix it it's not something I mean not that I was doing those things by the way but my point is it just like we live in an epidemic of of issues with people and I think it starts at these types of places being able to like actually open up to people um which isn't easy and by the way you know I'm not perfect at it at all but a couple of things I would say is number one is some places don't allow you to do that. If you work in the military, I don't want to stereotype, but it is my sense. Like if you work at a hedge fund on Wall Street, like if you come and talking about your feelings, people are going to be like, why are you here? Right. So mm -hmm. there are some, if, if you have, an, if you're ex existing in an environment where that's just not even like tolerated or seen as a bad thing, like you need to find it somewhere else because I think we all need some of it. What was lucky for me I guess what has really taught me this um, is like in the work that I do, being an author and talking to people about like the stuff that I talk about. And um, a lot of the people that read my books or that I meet are looking for a solution to a problem in their life. 
it could be a problem about their career or feeling fulfilled or making decisions or, you know, there's a lot of stuff. And like, as a result, what I learned really quickly, and this was like, a, and this is your world. So you, you, you know, you're, you're going to get it. I think is like, when I first did my book, my first book came out, like, I didn't want any of me in it. Like I barely talked about myself. I was tr telling about other people because I just didn't feel, I was like, this is not about me. What I realized, of course, is that anybody who wants to share that kind of information, the more that they can reveal about themselves and make themselves approachable to the reader and or to the listener, the better that the message will resonate because the more personal it is, the more powerful it is. And so I kind of, as part of the work that I do, was forced to learn how to be more open and how to tell my story in a way that was way more accessible to people and grounded in my own lived experience. So yeah, that's been like, that's the, for me, that's been really a big part of it. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think, I love what you said about the hedge fund and, and just thinking about the environment that you're in. Like if you're not in an environment where, you know, you can belong and bring your full self to the table or feel like you can be your full self, even if you don't know how to have the emotional skills yet to articulate it, um, you know, really, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'll share this with you after a link, but there's a book called The Art of Empathy about working with emotions and how things feel and how they articulate. And I think, you know, for men, right, it's, it's targeted for women for sure. But for men, I think there's so much value in the book because I, you're right. I don't think we're taught these things. And I think you have a really good framework and passion for your career. Is I want to solve problems for people uh, and help them uh, with the career decisions, all the things, which is a very fulfilling path that you're on. I, and I would say... If we want, if I learned one thing over the last couple of years, it's like empathetic. Let's just talk about men here. I'm not going to presume sure. to know how classify women or all men, but in my perspective, thinking about men in particular, like empathetic men are so much stronger than the, the non-empathetic men. Like compare like a Joe Biden to a Donald Trump. Like it's it's. I mean, unless you're like some sort of like been brainwashed, like it's so clear that Joe Biden is such a stronger person because he cares about other people and can express his own, like, you know, people talk about he's the perfect president for right now because his, he can, he, he, like the grief has transformed who he is as a person and he shares that. He's like, whereas you had Trump, who's just like all about projecting strength, which just makes him look weaker. Right, I, I think you're absolutely- Not to get political, but- No, well, one, the inauguration speech was beautiful, very unifying, clearly, uh, and the whole day. And uh, yeah, I, I think, being able to admit, hey, not everything's okay in this world, which is clearly what he did. Yeah. And then to say, you know, we're here to help build it back and bring it back together. Uh, all of us, not just one of us or some of us, right? I think the words and the communication around that can speak to a collective whole in a very kind of one-to-one -one way. And I think that's the power of good communication and being empathetic towards people's experiences. And I'm no expert at it, but I think I'm more attuned, like maybe yourself to watch out for it um yeah and also like i think there's a line too like at some point if you're like overly empathetic it's probably irritating to people i don't know where that line is maybe you know yeah. but like but because like you sometimes just have to do things right sure but um but yeah i never thought about that like that's a good question like what what is too much empathy maybe that's like a future conversation i don't know and hey, maybe it's your next book Maybe the uh, listeners can write in and say, because I'd love to know what people think about that. Hey, you know, I'll see if I can get some responses for you when we roll this out. Awesome. Um, so Patrick, let's, let's kind of come back to the, uh, you know, experience of what we've been going through. I'd love to know, you know, I know you mentioned the things you started to do, run, sleep, eat well, you know, do all these things, you know, let's say week to week right now. And a, what is sustainable health to you, uh, you know, in this moment in time? Oh my God, it's in the pandemic, it's so hard. Oh, it's so hard, but listen, I actually, because of all that stuff that I went through, and by the way, that ended up, I ended up leaving my job, starting my new career, working for myself. So all the things that I, the changes that I made as a result of this, cause like, I was like, I did the right, I did the, the path that I, like I went on the treadmill and look where I ended up. So that's why I decided to get off the treadmill and you know build something for myself, build my own treadmill, I guess, or whatever. Um, not a treadmill though. It's, more like a Peloton bike, maybe, because <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's way more cool and fun. Uh, but well, I think for me, listen, I, and again, I'm not like here to say that I'm like, 
um, the pinnacle of perfection on any of this stuff. I just try to do what I need to do to, to, to keep it all together. But I think number one is um, the things that I do that really help me is um, number one is I do have, like I have a fitness regimen that I stick to. So I, you know, I do have a Peloton bike that I got because I'm not going to gyms right now during a pandemic. So that super helpful to be able to at least have that if I don't feel like going outside or I want to go for a run, I like to walk places. So just physical activity, um, you know, yoga um, is something that I used to do a lot of. I need to get back into it because I miss going to classes, but just got to do it at home. Uh, I meditate every day. Um, I learned how to cook during the pandemic. So I have a pretty healthy, like I'll eat junk, you know, like last night to celebrate the inauguration, I ate an entire baguette. Good for you. It was so good. Oh my goodness. Um, but I just had like a salad for lunch and I would cook. Um, I, um, I sleep is really important to me and I don't often get enough sleep at night because I'm a little bit of a night owl. So I take tons of naps. Nice. Like tons of naps. I'm like Mr. Nap. Um, I go to acupuncture every month. That's like a really important ritual that I've been doing for almost a decade because it's like hitting the reset button on your life every month. Um, I take uh, vitamins, um, different sorts of vitamins, you know, probiotics, vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, I try to have a reasonably plant-based diet, although I will eat meat. I'm not anti-meat, but I just, you know, I, 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 I just don't, I try to make sure that it's balanced with a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and then I take vacations, Nice. lots of them as much as I can. Like I don't value working more hours at all. Got it. Got and it. I also take a lot of breaks during the day. Hmm. So all of those things together, I think there's probably more things to you, but like all those things together um, really make a difference for me. So cool. I mean, it sounds like you have a really dedicated, integrated, uh, self health routine and you experiment a bit, but all together you feel pretty good day in and day out because you're put health at the forefront. And that's, I think it's a special journey for the hyper ambitious. Uh, let's, let's transition a bit, Patrick, uh, to some of the things that you've worked on, working on, uh, you know, the book you wrote, uh, that I think was, you know, pretty big deal, uh, the 10% entrepreneur. And then I know you've done a number of things after. So let's give us some context in the last, you know, five to 10 minutes here on your kind of professional career and maybe what led you to writing the book and some of the things you're up to now. Sure. So, yeah. Oh my God. It's like, it's, it's been such a crazy journey. So I ended up like deciding to get out of the corporate world. Not I, with no plan, actually. I had no plan, but I just couldn't stay. I was really unhappy at, um, at my firm after everything that happened with the financial crisis. And I just, I sort of like lost my, lost my faith in the, in the organization and in the work. And in, I just felt like, man, this stuff is, it's all broken and I, it's just going to happen again. I'm going to get another job and it's going to blow up. And like, I don't want to do that again. And so I want to find a way to have more autonomy. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up leaving. I took a year long sabbatical. Kind of like trying to, Stella was trying to get her groove back, I guess. Uh, and it worked, like it was amazing. And I, I wrote about sabbaticals in my newest book. I think a sabbatical is amazing. And I've written a bunch of them on my, on my, um, on my blog as well about sabbaticals. So I did that, that was really good. And then I came back and I was like, what am I gonna do with my life? I had no idea. So I started doing these small projects and built like a portfolio of things that ended up giving me the idea of writing a book about how to be a part-time entrepreneur. So I wrote the book proposal, we were shopping it. I got an agent, which was a whole other long story. We were shopping it and then um, we (laughs) were getting rejected. I got 33 rejections. And um, then a journalist reached out to me and said, I'm writing an article about the history of the word FOMO and I traced it to you. And I said, yes, I came up with FOMO. Why do you care? And he said, it's in the dictionary. And I was like, that's crazy. He wrote the article. It went sort of viral. We then, my agent then showed it to the publishers. They ended up buying the 10% entrepreneur. So like that was what got me the book deal. I wrote the book, which I loved. It was such a wonderful experience. It came out in 2016. It did great. It came out in a bunch of languages. I, you know, promoted it all over the place and travel all over the world, but like in on my terms, 
not somebody else's terms, promoting it, came out in a bunch of languages. Um, and then, you know, I still, I still have an investing career. So like I have like, I write books, but I also do investing and I invest in a bunch of cool startups, some that have done really well. And then um, as I was doing book tour around the world, I remember I was in Beirut one night and a guy wanted to take a selfie with me because of the FOMO thing. And I was like, if I'm getting selfies in Beirut out of FOMO, like I should just write a book about it. Like FOMO is super interesting. It's a deep, it's a rich topic. There's so much demand for it. Um, people love FOMO to talk about it anyway. It's a big meme. So I decided to write a book about FOMO. I wrote that. Um, it came out in the middle of the pandemic, which was like impossible. Um, but, you know, it's doing pretty well. Um, it's out in a bunch of foreign languages. And then I also started a podcast called FOMO Sapiens, where we talk to people, you know, about the choices that they make in life because, you know, overcoming FOMO is about indecision and overcoming indecision. And so, so yeah, we've that, I started that, we're in season five, um, believe it or not. I think we have something like, Jesus, we probably have 90 episodes or something. I started doing it with Harvard Business Review for a while. I, I had, I was with them for three of my seasons, which was great. And then I decided I wanted to sort of take the show in a slightly different direction and have more control. So I spun it out this year and now it's, it's, it's back out on its own. Um, and finally, I just launched my first ever audio course with a company called Himalaya, which is a, a leading app for learning. And it's a podcast style course for the 10% entrepreneur called How to Be a Part-Time Entrepreneur, which developing that, I'd never done a course before. I was, frankly, I was a little nervous. Um, like, will this be good? Will people like it? Um, but luckily, um, I'm really pleased at how it came out. And so it just came out in January of 2021. And uh, yeah, and now I'm also doing a bunch of speaking. So that, yeah, I'm doing a lot of things. It's, uh, but the thing is, there's like internal consistency and everything is self-reinforcing. And like, when I do one thing, it helps the other things. And like, it all kind of comes together in a very symbiotic way. So I don't feel crazy about it. It's not like all fun. Like, I feel like I don't really work. It's weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I do see a, well, thank you for sharing. I do think there's a lot of connected. No, that was a lot. I just basically told you everything I do, so. It's okay, I, I, we're recording here, but I, you know, I memorized it all. But, you know, I think between investing, speaking, writing, the podcast, audio, all the things that you're working on, yes, they, they compound. But I think you also said something I want to build on is they're all connected in certain ways. Um, and if you think about my question to you, just being in kind of a vision about branding and marketing and just loving kind of thinking about an impact, the legacy that someone has, if you had a higher order level message that, you know, millions of people could see, you know, what do you think that would be? If, I know this is the hard problem, the hardest question to answer, but what, what would you like that message to be the higher order of impact that connects all these you know, projects and, and visions that you're kind of cultivating on the ground floor, right? You know? Yeah. That. No, I mean, it's, we're going through, so I'm, you know, the work that you do, I'm doing something very similar right now. We've been really going deep on all this stuff with me, okay. which is super cool and interesting. And because um, it's hard, the, the challenging thing for me, maybe you can come up with a solution. Hard <laughs> thing for me is like, I almost, and this is my problem my whole darn life is like, I'm doing a lot of different things. So what is the over, so like, what is Patrick an expert in? You know, like Patrick's an expert in blank, right? Um, well, you could say, and I don't mean this like in an arrogant way, but I'm saying like, okay, well, I'm a, I guess I'm an expert in part-time entrepreneurship. I wrote a book on it. I speak about it. I, you know, I, I made a course on it, but you know, Patrick's an expert in decision-making because I wrote a book on it and I speak on it and I have a podcast on it. And so those two things are different. So what's the overarching thing that unites them? Well, I would say it's all about making choices in your life to live, um, live fully and autonomously. Hmm. Um, but like, that doesn't sound, it's not very catchy. So, you know, but it's all about that we live in a time where the ground is shifting. Like the way things were done before will not be done again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you have to make smart decisions about how to be, how to thrive in that world. And if you do, you can live an incredible life. And if you don't, you're going to be dying of the FOMO. So that's, that's how I think about it. Well, it, I think there is a very interesting um, 
commonality though, right? Because you've had to learn the hard way in a lot of things in your own life, right? Through your health journey and your experiences because of decisions that you made that were on different extremes. And so if you can make decisions to make the equilibrium maybe a little more balanced opposed to all these highs and lows, right? You can, I think to your point, through those smart decisions, through the ways you've set your life up uh, and the systems or processes you might put in, can live a life that maybe is a little more meaningful with making good decisions 90, 95% of the time, right? So uh, I think whatever you're working with in that magic, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right. There is there's a very powerful uh, line that can be drawn between that, that connects the dots and all your work. I'm excited to see how it all turns out. I mean, I thank I you what you do in the world. Appreciate that. Well, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you and, and um, yeah, and you know, I don't usually get into all these topics. So, so I hope it's something new for people to, to hear about. Hey, it's a good audience. A lot of our listeners are, are younger professionals, very entrepreneurial. So I'm sure you a lot to, you know, they should know this stuff before, you know, they have to go through the hard, the hard mud of it all. Uh, Patrick, where can people find you, reach out to you or, um, you know, connect with you? What would be best? Uh, the best places to find me are patrickmcginnis.com, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-M-C-G-I-N-N-I-S.com. Uh, the podcast is at FOMOSapiens.com and obviously on all the podcast platforms, FOMOSapiens. And then on social, I'm at Patrick J. McGinnis on Instagram and PJ McGinnis on Twitter. We have Facebook, but like, I feel like nobody's on Facebook anymore. So why bother? Um, and then you can, you can reach out to me on email at let's connect at patrickmcginnis.com. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks for showing up and sharing with us. You know, I, uh, I felt a little dull before the chat and I feel alive again. So uh, thank you for That's good. me. So and thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode as much as I did, I hope you leave a review on the platform of your choice and share it with a friend who you think would find it valuable. If you'd like to receive our written newsletter and thought leadership, head on over to bwmissions.com backslash newsletter and subscribe. See you on the next show.